Here's the charm. Okay. I know it won't let me rotate my phone that way. Okay. So we're going to try it one more time. I invited you before I started the video, Julie. So I'm hoping that it works this time. This is what we did last time with Sarah and it should fingers crossed saying, saying prayers, crossing fingers. And let's see. Yes, I see all the other people coming on, which is awesome. For those of you, let's see, they're watching on your computer. Okay, oh, it's working, Julie. It's working. It's adding you. It's connecting. Connecting. You're there. You're there. <laughs> Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm well, how are you? Is this working? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? I hear you just fine. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. I can hear you great. Now, Yay! are you now, able, are to, you put able to put in a headphone so there's, a no, headphone echo? So there's no echo? Oh, sorry. Yes, forgot. You did ask me that. Me right back here. Yeah, so if yeah, I have, so to, have, I have to have the headphone in. So you guys can so turn, you guys yours. Can turn yours. All right. If you put on set, then you can't hear. Oh, I'm just thinking about the other people. You know what? If you guys do it, hold on a second. 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 Okay. Okay. So Julie went to go, so grab, Julie went to go grab her headphones. I am back. I'm untangling them. Okay. 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 This is perfect. This is perfect. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm here. I'm just untangling while we talk. <laughs> I'll get this. No, way. that's perfect. No, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm glad we got it figured out. Okay, and I'm trying to get this phone angle so you guys can look at my bed. I feel like it's so close. I feel like it's so close. Okay, oh, that's better. It's the echo's gone. And howdy, howdy. Does that work? Yeah, there's still a little bit of an okay. echo, but I can live with it. Do you have an echo on your end? I'm not hearing it. Okay. Good, good, good. Well, I am so excited that you are here. I'm so excited that you've been our author for the month. So this is um, Julie Berry. The what? I apologize. The brilliant Julie Berry. <laughs> the feisty Julie Berry. Oh. <laughs> We have stories we won't share right now, but I, I love you and I'm so excited that you are. Oh, thank you, Amy. I'm so excited that you're here. Um, so this, I made this public just so other people can see it and kind of um, be able to bask in your goodness. Um, but this really is for my book club. And so after tonight, it's not going to be public anymore. So if you're not a member of the book club and you want to be on the book club, um, just go and join Michelle's book club. And then you will be able to visit um, the authors during the month and just have a really good time. So we're so glad you're here, Julie. I'm going to start by reading your bio, okay. and then we'll just jump into stuff. Um, so Julie Berry is the author of the 2017 Prince Honor and Los Angeles Times Book Prize shortlist novel, The Passion of Dulce. The Carnegie and Edgar shortlisted All the Truth That's in Me, which I read, and it was amazing. Everything you write's amazing. Um, and many other acclaimed middle grade novels and picture books. She holds an, a BS in communication from Rensselaer okay, and an MFA from Vermont College. She lives in Southern California with her family. Now, I just want to start at the beginning by telling everyone um, she has a website, julieberrybooks.com. If you go on there, you can sign up for um, her newsletter. She doesn't, she only sends out, what, two or three maybe a year? 
at most, I've actually yet to send one at all, but I intend to before summer is over. <laughs> I promise. That's good. So sign up for some good intentions there. Um, and also, if, if you fall in love with her, like I have, obviously, and then you think she's brilliant, like I do, um, the best thing you can do for the authors that you love is to go on Amazon and to leave reviews. Reviews are love for us. So, so if you haven't done it yet, if you read any of her books, please, when you're done with this, wait till it's done, go and leave a review and we'll go from there. So first of all, we, so the book that we chose this month, I know it's going to be backwards, but we chose Lovely War. And I'm surprised you're not wearing your pink jacket. Oh, it's a little warm for that. <laughs> it is. Yes. Yeah. Down in Southern California, it is warm. Um, so as you're watching this, my friends, if you have questions, I can see it in front of me. And so we'll stop our conversation and we'll answer your questions. And I have some questions that um, were asked on the website. And so we're going to jump in with one of those. And then I have questions for you and some questions about the book. Before I jump into all of that, is there anything that you wanted to, to say? Or is there anything you want to announce? Anything coming up? Anything that you want to talk about? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for inviting me. How awesome is that, that you have this great big book club? And I've seen such enthusiastic comments from people throughout the month. So thank you very much. I really look forward to this. Um, as for me, Lovely War came out in March. So it's been, what is it now? About It's been out about five months, I guess. Um, and that's been really exciting to see. And I do have some really exciting new stuff this fall I have three new picture books coming up so I will take just a minute because I just got the box of the first one in the mail uh, yesterday so that is a Christmas picture book which seems weird to be talking about in July but it's called and I know it's backwards long ago on a silent night Aww. and it's just so beautiful the art is just so incredible so I'm super excited about this it's a it's a Christmas Oh, how do I describe it? It's kind of um, Baby I Love You meets the Nativity Story. So it's kind of a, you know, a family celebrating their love for their baby and sort of tying that to some of the really special aspects of the Christmas story. So that is Long Ago on a Silent Night. And then I have two others. One is called Don't Let the Beasties Escape This Book, which is super fun and very playful about medieval beasties coming alive and escaping a, a bestiary or a oh, book of beasts. Oh, that's cute. And then I have one called Happy Right Now, and that's coming out in October, and it will be followed by one called Cranky Right Now. So um, <laughs> I need that one. Excited. <laughs> yeah, right? that one was autobiographical. And, um, so it's been really fun to have some picture books, which is kind of a first for me. I've been doing novels for a lot of years, and I'm super excited to get to visit with little kids. So, so that's kind of what's new and happening in my world right now. How fun. I have a picture book coming out in November, my first one. And it is, in a lot of ways, it's harder to write than a novel because I'm good at just like pontificating and putting all the words out there. But when you have to say, here's this beautiful story, do it in 600 words, it's hard. It's really hard. I know. It's, much, it's deceptively difficult. So um, it's funny how people think, oh, I'll start with an easy little picture book and then I'll move up to a novel. I think, oh, no, it's the other way around. <laughs> you have to really be at the top of your game to get it done in such a short amount of space. So I'm with you. Yeah, but it's a really good mental exercise. I think everyone should take their novel and, and, and pare it down to, into a picture book story because I think that you mm -hmm. would really get to those just elements, the core elements of the story. Especially if you can have, you know, what is it, the 16 dramatic page turns? Yeah. Then you'll know that you've got some pacing in your story. Oh. So. <laughs> well, that, this is a good segue to a question I'm going to ask you about. So I met you a few years ago when uh, my friend Nan invited you out to be the keynote at ANWA conference, the ANWA conference, which is an amazing conference, just have to tell everyone. Um, and then last year I was able, well, no, Earlier this year, I was able to see you again at Storymakers in Utah, and you taught a brilliant class on your post-writing editing. You did color coding, and I had my thing out, and it was, it was just amazing what you did. So I wanted to ask you, as far as your pre-writing process, are you one that plots out? I think you remember you saying that you plot everything out and use kind of a scaffolding, and then you fill in each scene, but am I remember that correctly, or are you kind of a, what's your process like? 
Well, so with Lovely War, which is set chiefly during World War I, I did have to have a bit of a framework in mind because I was following the actual events of an actual war. And so I had to make sure that I was following real timelines. And I had four major characters, not including the gods as narrators, so I had to figure out what each of the four would be doing in an actual war setting at all times. So I did have to have a kind of a spreadsheet for that as I kind of worked my way forward. But in general, I'm not the writer that outlines in advance. I'm very much a figure it out as I go kind of person. So it was sort of this funny dance of, um, you know, letting interpersonal interactions kind of go as they wanted to, and then having to sometimes retrofit them into actual war events. And, and you know, they say, um, what's the sta statement that, you know, um, you don't have to see the end of your journey when you're driving at night. You just have to see as far as the headlights will take you. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's kind of how I wrote this book is, you know, figuring it out as I go and looking as far ahead as the headlights of World War One would take me, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so it was very, and I'm a very improvisational writer, figure it out as I go, make tons of changes, um, clean up the mess afterwards. That's kind of how I live life, and I don't always clean up the mess afterwards <laughs> in my actual life, <laughs> but I make my kids do it or something. Uh, but um, yeah, so this was, this was very much a journey. I mean, when I started out proposing to tell a love story set during World War I as narrated by Greek gods, I had no idea where this thing was going to land. <laughs> And I knew that if I didn't deliver a very satisfying ending, then people would want to throw this book at me. So I had to really r revise and revise to get it to where I felt good about it. And it was satisfying on all accounts, like everybody. So, and this is such an interesting premise to, to tell a war story, a love story. We, we've seen a lot of those, but you know, when I first read what it was about, what it was about, I thought, okay, you've got gods telling the story. How is that going to work? Now, I have the physical book, but I also, I love audiobooks. So I listened to the audiobook, and it was delicious. Like, you made me want to quit writing. That's how good it was. But at the same oh, time, no, 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 I'm not done yet. But at the same time, write all the time. You know, when you read something that's so good, you're like, oh, my gosh, I could never write like that, but I want to. <laughs> and so you want to go learn all the things. Um, did you... Was that an idea that culminated all at the same time? Was like, I think I'll write a love story in World War One with the Greek gods telling it? Or was it like, I mean, what came first? It was very piecemeal. And I think most of my story ideas are. They're kind of like, this interests me and this interests me. And I wonder if I can put them together. So for starters, I, I'd been kind of thinking about World War One. I. I actually started thinking about World War Two, But there's so many books about World War Two. Um, but I was doing a little bit of research into World War II and what life was like on the home front. And it, as I was looking at that, I realized that um, a lot of the programs and initiatives that, that we talk about taking place on the home front during World War II actually got their start in World War I. So, for example, we talk about Rosie the Riveter, and she's got the great poster, but Rosie the Riveter's mom was making bombs during World War I. We never talk about that, and yeah. I didn't know that, and that was really fascinating. We talk about Victory Gardens, but the, the parents of the children who made Victory Gardens in World War II were children planting Victory Gardens in World War I. So as I started to realize that so many of these things got their start one war before, I thought, why don't we talk more about that war? And that was sort of an interesting exploration in itself. Why, you know, and I have some theories as to why that is. But um, I started researching it. As soon as I find something that I feel like we ought to be talking about more than we are, that gets my curiosity up. And so I started researching the war. And you know, there's so many aspects of it that were so engrossing and so fascinating, things I had forgotten from high school or things I probably never knew. And um, I started thinking about the types of characters I might be interested in writing about. And I knew I wanted it to be a love story. And I really struggled to find the voice and perspective that would allow me to say all the things that I wanted to say about the war. Because, you know, as you say, we see a lot of romances set during a time of war. And I felt like if I told your basic boy meets girl during World War I story, I would be committing a sort of historical malpractice. You know, that I would be failing to do justice to the enormity and scope of the war and all the ways in which it touched society and individual lives and all the hearts it broke. But a novel by its nature is a fairly intimate look at just a couple of characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you got, especially a love story, you've got to be able to get really close to a few. And so you trade off uh, closeness 
for breadth. But I didn't want to trade off closeness for breadth. I wanted to have it all. And so that's why I sort of hit upon the idea of the gods. I thought, what if love personified could tell this story? And I thought that could be interesting. But then I realized love personified is really not your storyteller that you'd choose for a war scene in the trenches in combat. And so then I thought, well, maybe we need war personified also to tell some of this story. And then I thought, wait a minute, we already have love personified <laughs> and we already have war personified and there are already secret lovers. And it was just like hot dog, you know, from that point on, it was off and running. And I'd really struggled to find my way into this piece. I'd written gobs of pages of beginnings that just went in the garbage until I kind of settled on that idea. And as soon as I did, it just, so that's kind of the process, you know, you, you flounder around until it starts to feel right. And, and I knew, I knew the chief problem was going to be one of point of view. And I think that's a useful lesson in itself, you know, for anybody. And I don't mean to assume that your book club includes aspiring writers, but I think every project has a, a lot of problems, but one chief thorny, sticky, messy problem. And you can usually kind of tell what it's going to be right from the start. And I think if you really tackle that head on and get real creative about how to solve that problem, that may be the secret to that piece's unique potential. You know, mm -hmm. um, like I think, you know, when I wrote All the Truth That's In Me, the question was, can I tell a story from what feels like a second person point of view? And when I wrote The Passion of Dulce, I thought, can I tell a story that deals in spiritual subjects in a non-religious imprint kind of way? And, you know, on and on we go. So I think that each project's sticky problem is the key to its, its real potential for, you know, originality. Yeah. I'm blathering. <laughs> no, no, no. This is, <laughs> they'd rather hear you talk than me. So please talk, talk, talk. Um, I loved, I love the, the point of view though, because, you know, when they're talking, especially when Aphrodite is talking, you've got, you've got James and you've got Hazel in the same room. You're inside both of their heads and hearts at the same moment. And I was so enthralled in the situation and so attached to both because so many have to switch POVs, but you were able to tell the story with this, with this omniscience of the gods. And it was, it was so, um, I was so entrenched in, in the story that way. And I, and I, I think sometimes when you're left to guess and fill in the blanks, sometimes it's really good, but other times when you know, it just makes that tension even more when you know exactly she did this, but then he was surprised by this and you're like, Oh, I know it was just, it was brilliant. Um, you know, and you talked about the theme for your, your other book. So for me, the theme obviously for this one was love and, um, Aphrodite on was it page 45. She says she, she wants to show him what was it, 450, what love looks like. And, that to me was, to me was the overall theme. Um, you didn't define what it was, but you, you showed us what it looked like. It's the whole action speak louder than words. And then you also showed that, and I love how she talks about, um, Oh, I highlighted it. She talks about the brokenness of people I'm trying to see if I have it on my thing where she says, um, Yes, yeah, she says, I envy the mortals. It's because they're weak and damaged that they can love. She says, we need nothing. They're lucky to need each other. And I just, I just found that fascinating that you're writing this story told by people that we think are perfect. Um, and in the end, you realize that she feels just as broken. And so does Hephaestus, uh, you know, as, as the mortals. And I just think that it's, it's love that, that heals that brokenness. Thank you. I, it makes me so happy to hear you say this because, you know, that's, that's what you're going for. And you don't, you know, you don't want to be messagey when you write, but you do hope, especially since I write for young people, although I, I feel like I write for every age, but especially writing for young people, I feel like it's so important that they have a sense of what love can look like and what it ought to look like. And they may or may not have had any models in their actual experience of what love can look like and um and and i i particularly want young people to realize that they deserve to be cherished and that they deserve to be respected and and celebrated and 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 prized and and treated with 
utmost courtesy and kindness and that any of the other kinds of costumes that we sometimes dress attraction or sexuality in and we call it love are, are deceptions. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be preachy, but, um, you know, I, I got a, an email a couple weeks ago from a teenager and, um, it made me cry because she said something to the effect of, you know, as a young person, I, as a young girl, I struggle with self-esteem issues and hadn't really understood that I deserve to be, what, what it means that I deserve to be loved. And this book has made me think differently about that. And I just thought, okay, I, I could stop right there. You know, I, I could just hang up my hat and say mission accomplished. So that, that made me very happy. So thank you for talking about that. That's very dear to me. Yeah. Well, and Amy says, you don't have to be perfect to be loved. And, and it's so true. When I was dating my husband um, years ago, he said, um, he said, you're pretty, but don't let it go to your head. That fades. <laughs> He says, I, I want to see what's inside. And at first I was like, that's so rude. But, you know, going through, um, you know, being pregnant and then, and then fertility problems and now getting older, um, I have never once felt unloved or not beautiful in his eyes because it's not the appearance that he was attracted to at the beginning anyway. And that, that's the message here, um, especially in the end, you know, when, when, when she's hurt and, and it doesn't matter. And, and he comes home and he's broken and it doesn't matter because it, it's like it's a soul to soul kind of love. I think another really overall um, arching message that I took from this was that we need to get out of our own way. When there's someone that wants to love us, then we should let them love us. You know, we should be able to accept it. Love, love can grow when you are in a relationship where it's symbiotic. And I think... I know people and I, in my life, I've held back sometimes and I put up those walls because it's scary or I've made the decision for someone else. And that's what they did. You know, you couldn't love a broken man. You can't love a woman with scars. And, and I think um, that sometimes we really do just need to get out of our own way and allow mm -hmm. that vulnerability and that love in. Mm -hmm. It's a leap of faith. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, becoming intimate, and I'm talking about emotionally and spiritually, becoming spiritually and emotionally intimate or any other kind of intimacy with anyone is a great big act of trust, and, and it is scary. Um, hopefully it's also exciting and joyful, which kind of propels us over our fears, but um, at some point or other, as you say, we have, you're right, you're absolutely right. And, and we, we have to continue to learn to get out of our own way. You know, uh, as, as I get older and look in the mirror and think, whoo, <laughs> I don't look like the wedding picture, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you're beautiful. And very, oh, bless you. So are you, but I'm, you know, I'm very fortunate to have uh, a partner and husband who, you know, I don't know what his problem is, but he likes me. So <laughs> you're very, very likable. And I think that's the thing is, you know, I think a lot of times we, we come up with this list and we go, okay, they must love me because of this and this and this, but how can they love me? because of this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and the person on the other side is just saying, I love you. Just let me love you. Stop telling me why I shouldn't and stop telling me that I don't. Um, right. So yeah, I think, I think a big lesson that I took away from this was just to get out of your own way. Cause when James is going through his whole thing and she's downstairs, he's like, I don't want to see her. I just want to reach my hand for the book and smack the kid and go, <laughs> come on, don't make the decision for her and let her decide. And then she did the same thing. I'm like, did you not learn anything? Um, but speaking of Hazel, I had a question for you. So um, I have notes here. That's what I keep looking over here. So on page 2420, so th there's been the accident and, and mm -hmm. Hazel now has got some injuries and you chose to have James and Colette to not tell Hazel that that she, um, she was hurt while she was saving Colette. And you said heroism is much too heavy a burden to carry. Mm. I'm curious at your thoughts on that. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, I feel like there's always the temptation, if you've been heroic, for that thing that was done in a moment of kind of, pure intention to turn into this crown that you wear, right? 
you know, it kind of like, and I'm just speaking generally, let's say somebody performs an act of heroism, saves a child from a burning building mm -hmm. or something like that. And they do it in a pure act of selfless, you know, regard for others. And then they're on every talk show in the nation for a couple of weeks. Yeah. I don't know, I've never been in that situation, but I imagine that that might begin to kind of corrupt and mar what was done in a really pure moment and turn it into a, a source of, a, a kind of temptation to feel a certain way about yourself or maybe to resent, um, you know, especially if, if you were hurt in doing it. You know, I just, uh, I just felt like, you know, let, let it be pure, let it have been um, the act of a moment, the act of love, and let it not be a kind of baggage that you carry around. I think, you know, what's the saying? Um, oh, it's from, I mean, I should not be quoting Rudyard Kipling, but, you know, Rudyard Kipling has in his poem, If, the, the statement about um, success and failure both being imposters mm -hmm. or both being deceivers in a way. And I think that there's something about heroism that creates a kind of, um, I don't know, it, that it can be as, as crushing a thing to have to carry around for the rest of your life as failure or humiliation could be. And I think that success can corrupt, you know, people go out to do a thing that they love and, it's, and sometimes they're fabulously successful at it and it, it, it can damage something pure about them or about why they do the thing they do. Now I'm really like philosophizing, but I just felt like um, Hazel would have wanted to do it and she wouldn't have wanted to be praised for the rest of her life for having done it. You know, she's a modest person. Yeah. So that was how I made that choice. I know it was kind of a weird choice. But <laughs> no, it wasn't weird at all. It was one of those that made me want to, you know, it, there's good questions and bad questions. It wasn't a distracting question, but I went, that is a really purposeful thing that you put in there. And it, it was one of the th those things that got me thinking about things. And I love that you're waxing philosophical because this is about the book, but it's also about you and, and the values that you have and the things that you want to put out there. Because that's why we write, right? We don't write. We, we don't want to be, um, you know, you said preachy and you're not, definitely. But we want the reader to walk away with, um, we want them to hopefully be changed. And really, I think all good books have the goal of giving hope. Mm, and, sure. and I think that's what this does. The hope that no matter how broken you feel physically or emotionally, um, that you're worthy of being loved. And most likely there's someone out there who wants to love you and can love you if you let them. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that's beautiful. And um, again, I'm looking at my notes. Hephaestus says, <laughs> there's no going back um, once you've known the goddess of love there's no forgetting, no moving on, no letting go. And I think I just, I loved, I just loved it. This book is just filled with all these beautiful nuggets of truth. And I think that your readers, young and not as young, you know, can walk away from this feeling love. And that's how you know that you've done your job, that it wasn't just, that was a good book. But the end, when I knew that the mortals were happy and that their kids were going to be taken care of during World War II, that was really cool. But the very end, when you showed the humanity in a goddess, and then and you found out that all of this was because she wanted her broken husband to want her. And, um, you know, she, she just, I think I highlighted this one. She says, you never got to know me on page 449. Um, she says, you never chose me and you never got to know me. And I think sometimes we can be in a relationship with someone and if we think it's out of convenience, um, you know, or sometimes we get lackadaisical in our relationships. Just the idea that she wanted to be seen because that's when we feel real and that's when we feel loved and you can't love unless you see. And that's another message of this book and it's not seeing what we look like or seeing our problems, but just who we are. I just think it's, mm -hmm. oh, Amy really loved the ending. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> it's just so good. It was just, it was just delicious. It just, I loved it. Okay. Oh, um, so Jill Warner on the website said, what are some unexpected things you've learned since getting an agent and being published? So we're switching gears just a little bit. 
Oh boy. Um, well, you know, I think it's like everything, right? Like before you go to college, you think you sort of know what going to college is like and you get there and you find that, yes, it is like that, but it's also a whole lot more than that, that you couldn't have anticipated or mm -hmm. starting your first job or getting married or becoming a parent. Like in all these ways, these things are like what we thought and wholly unlike it. You know, when you start out, you just think, oh, if I could just only have a book with my name on it, that'd be so great. And all my problems would be solved and all my emotional holes would be filled and I would finally just know that bigger. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and, you know they, and 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 it is wonderful it is wonderful to have your name on a book and it is wonderful to share your work with others but you wake up the next morning and you're still you and you're you know it, it didn't magically repair everything in you and it didn't um, make you wise and it, you know, it just made you a person who has a book and then you start feeling like, oh shoot, they're going to realize I'm a fraud, but, you know, because we have this idea that a person with a book has their act together somehow. Um, I shattered that enough. image, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, some unexpected things I've learned. Well, one thing that, a couple things I've learned, um, one is that one of the great privileges of this line of work is the opportunity to share. Oh, sorry, that's the, the cat feeder is automated and it has a message with my son saying, cats, get your food. <laughs> that's awesome. Sorry about that. That's going to show up on the recording. Um, <laughs> the opportunity to share with young people and to be an influence to them is a real delight and a privilege that I didn't really anticipate. Like I didn't really think about the presenting to kids part of it when I set out to be a writer. And I realized that kids have such a, um, such an exalted sense of what authors are, you know, books are magical mm -hmm. and therefore authors are magical. So when you go into a classroom of young kids and they are so excited, they think you walked on water and it's not that that's flattering to your ego, but what that is, is it's an amazing golden ticket. It's an opportunity to say the word that makes a difference to them, to say the things that their teachers and parents have been saying all the time. But when you say it, it has meaning. So mm -hmm. when you go in and say, you know, set your standards high and set big goals for your life and go after it. And you could be a writer too. You could be anything you want to be and get your education and read all the books you can and, and tell your stories to the world. They hear that. They hear that. And, and it touches their lives. And, you know, you get these emails from kids or from parents or from teachers where you hear that, you know, that child has been working on a book all year ever since you came and visited. And I realize that's got nothing to do with me being anything other than the fact that I'm Julie Berry author. And that author gives me a badge of of magic and believability to kids. So I see that as a tremendous responsibility mm -hmm. and, a, and a, an enormous privilege. It's not that I've done anything. You know, I haven't been like the, you know, that amazing football coach that inspires the kids and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not there every day. I come in for 45 minutes. So I've earned nothing except because I'm Julie Berry author, I have this, this moment where I can say something that might make a difference, that might encourage kids. So I try to do that. I try to bring all the kindness and positivity that I can. Mm -hmm. um, you can't, you know, have a one-on-one -on -one chat with all the kids, but um, that, you know, I, I never met an author until I was in college. And that was a very awkward thing where I won a little prize and this author presented it and we shook hands and she kind of looked like she'd rather not be there. <laughs> no problem <laughs> but uh, at any rate I realize now that like little bookish Julie would have been over the moon to, to meet a real live author and see that she was a normal person and have her say hey this isn't you know this isn't rocket science you could do it too that would have meant the world to me so um, that's one thing that I didn't anticipate and that uh, means a lot to me and then I think the other thing that I've learned is sort of related to that, but with regard to readers of any age, particularly adults, um, which is that stories are so much bigger than, than me, the creator, bigger than any one reader. They are, they're an opportunity. They, there's something about them, like all art, that can tap into something bigger, more infinite, more, 
more more spiritually necessary and um and i've had the experience especially with this book of being on tour and having some people share with me how how much my words have meant to them and you know people that have driven hours to have the chance to meet me and i'm like why would you do that i wouldn't do that i wouldn't drive two hours to see me you know <laughs> but i realized that what's going on is that something in the book was a conduit for them it, it filled a need for them and it brought some beauty or some joy or some purpose or understanding into their lives and so and that's not me i can't take credit for that that's just sort of the magic of creativity and of books for example you know i uh i had a woman tell me with a lot of emotion that her son fought in afghanistan and when he came back he couldn't talk about it and she didn't understand and she said this book helped me understand my son better, so thank you for that. And I thought, I didn't earn that. You know, that's not me. That's not my wisdom. That's not my anything. That's just that stories are sort of little sprouts or shoots from off a, a much bigger and more divine root system, mm -hmm. you know. And so um, I feel, I mean, that to me is a kind of holy and sacred thing that I get to be a little a little gardener in the weeds, you know, tending my little shoots and that they get to provide some value for someone else. But it's not, it's not me. I, 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 that's what I really want to emphasize. It's not me, but it's this miracle that I get to be a part of. And I feel um, tremendously grateful for that. It, it's something that sustains me at times when I feel like, why am I even doing this? And does it even matter? You know, yeah. the, that, those people show me that it matters. It does. And, and, you know, you're, you, you keep saying it's not you because these truths are universal and they're divine. And so, you know, we're not making up new things, but, but it is you in the fact that um, this is the story that, that came from your brain, from your heart. This is the way that you garden, the way that you tell it adds a richness. And when they've read it and they come to see you, they've spent hours with you. And, and yes, with John and Hazel and, and, and uh, Colette and Colette, oh gosh, because my brain. Um, That's a good name too. I like that name. It is. It is. Um, but they spent time with you and, you know, I've met you. We've had a fun conversation. We, you know, we had birthday cake together a couple of years ago and done some fun things. Um, and I felt closer to you after reading this because you, you can't write a book that has this much beauty in it without being a beautiful person. I don't think that, and I don't want to say ugly people, I mean on the inside. I don't think a person with ill intent, they can't create something like that. The prism that you are to take the truths that are, um, that are eternal and that are profound and to be able to add the color to it through the story so we can see it in a different light, that is a gift and that is you. And, and I love the fact that you approach it with humility um, just makes me love you even more. I'm just going to have to move next door. I've just decided we're going to be best friends now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's awesome. I would love that. <laughs> That's sweet. Okay. No, I won't do that. I won't be a stalker, but I will see you at conferences. That'll be fun. <laughs> I know you're like too late. <laughs> I was thinking about our, our restaurant adventures just earlier today. I <laughs> just started laughing, remembering that I was trying to remember what did go down, and then I remembered it. Anyway, I'm not meaning to be cryptic, but... <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we need to explain it really quick, though. So Okay, you go. <laughs> okay. So the first time I ever met Julie, I met you that Thursday night before the conference at Anwa, and it was my birthday. And so we were down in the hotel, and she, you were so sweet. You're like, let's get something to eat. And so there was a guy that worked at the inside restaurant in the hotel, and we sat there and we're just chatting and we've got the little menu. Well, no, we didn't even have menus. We were just chatting. No menus. We were waiting and, forever and, for the guy to bring us menus. But he was chatting with a friend, like three feet away from us. Didn't even forever. pay attention to us. So, <laughs> you know, and you're the kind of person that I like to think that I would be in a situation, but that I'm not. So you just get up and you reach around and you grab the menus and we're looking and he finally saunters over and it was like, he's... What did he say? Do you remember what he said? It was something kind of snarky. It was like, what'd you do? Just barge behind the bar and help yourself to menus? And I said, well, they were right in the doorway, and we had sat here for a long time, and you had not acknowledged us. So I just grabbed one from the doorway. 
and then he got he got really big and like belligerent like yeah, he, he puffed up he got phys- physically and verbally really like he wanted to intimidate us right and i wasn't having that <laughs> so i'm sitting here going i want to pee my pants i don't know <laughs> People are getting all mad. And, and in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to say something really smart. And I'm going to protect her because she's our keynote. And I'm the, I'm the co-chair. And, and this is what I did. <laughs> I mean, the best first impression. Because he's like, you know, you said, are you going to take our order? And, and he said something like, well, do I, do I need to do that? Or do you, can you do that yourself too or something? And then, and then you, wow, what did you say? I think I said something like, are you mad at me? Do you have a problem? Oh, yes. With me? I'm, I, you, you're getting aggressive with me. What is the deal? I just want to order some food. Why are you mad at me? What's your problem? You said, you know, <laughs> I think we're going to go somewhere else because this is inappropriate. And he's like, no, I'll take your order. And you're like, if I weren't so tired, we would go somewhere else. Because by that time, it's 10. So he made the food and brought it to us. I don't think we dipped him. They went upstairs to my, to my hotel room. We're eating food, though, just you and I. And I'm like, I wasn't brave. I wasn't brave. That's all I kept thinking. You're going to think oh. I'm like this. But then, so that's when I just called you feisty because you, you were having none of it. And I'm like, I want to be that. And I am now. That experience helped change me because now I'm, I'm much more bold in, because I get this thing in my brain where I'm like, okay, someone's being mean. Now, if I were to say something and like in the next minute, if I were to say, do you want to know more about my religion? They'd go, not if that's you where you belong and you're not, rah, 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 you know? So I'm like, I have to be nice to everybody. But it was such a powerful example to me of, um, cause you were kind. There's a difference between being nice and kind and you were kind, but you had these boundaries and he puffed up and you just went, nope. You're like this puffer fish that just went. <laughs> well, what was interesting is how completely and instantly he, he was being very aggressive verb, you know, and he immediately went switched to like, Oh, I'm so sorry. And everything's great. And can I get you an extra blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what is this? So, um, I'll tell you a story though, that gives like a little clue into this. Now I grew up on a farm and we had a million dogs and I had a sister who bred dogs and she, she had some, like some of the more like, um, potentially aggressive breeds not they weren't but like rottweilers and you know breeds that could be potentially you know um dangerous and um she had told me and i was a kid and i don't know if this is actually true but she had told me and i'd always remembered this um that if an angry dog charges you like snarling and snapping like it's gonna bite that they're trying to be the alpha and that you have to be the alpha to protect yourself and so (laughs) When I first meet my husband, like the night that we met in college, we ended up going to Dunkin' Donuts and then we took this long, late walk and we're walking around the college town talking. And I'm like, oh, this guy's so great and he's so cute and I like totally liked him. And we're walking and this this dog charges us. (laughs) And I like push my, you know, not even boyfriend, push this cute boy behind me. And I got right down there and like, you get away from us, you (laughs) rah! I totally alphaed this dog. And I like, even now, like my throat was sore. I was like, you get away from us. Back to your, you get back. And, and he did. The dog ran away. And, and so, like, what the heck is did this? Did he propose right guy? there? He was just, this woman gets back. Just, pretty much me. <laughs> well, I'd like to think I'm a nice person, but <laughs> you are, but you've got those, those very healthy boundaries. <laughs> very healthy. I like, I would walk down like a dark alley in the Bronx with you. <laughs> because You'd be like, Arr! now let me tell you a story in my defense. <laughs> you would totally just put them in defense. But that was amazing. That was my first impression of you. And I thought, <laughs> man, you don't mess with this woman. But then you have this just brilliant, articulate, sweet, creative side. And you just, yeah. I just think, I don't think you're perfect because no one's perfect. But <laughs> I think you're really, really close. 
Well, you see why I took this call, right? I just knew it was going to be like an hour of flattery <laughs> from you. So, but it's all sincere. <laughs> it really is. Well, well, I don't say you. that to You're very everybody. kind. <laughs> I know. I am really kind. <laughs> I'm really nice. Oh, you are. Okay. Well, we've got like maybe five more minutes and this is, oh gosh, oh, unless you, we okay. can keep talking like all night if you want, no, no, but no. I know that you're busy. I want to make sure, no, no. I want to make sure that we answer any questions that anybody posted. I know a couple people posted some things today and I don't remember. So we, we kind of answered those as we went along. One of the questions okay. was, um, which of the love stories came first to your mind? Did you start off with the gods involved or did that come later? I mean, it, the way I say it is, I knew I wanted to tell a love story, but until I found the gods, I didn't know what the love story was going to be. So to my mind, there is no Hazel without Aphrodite. Yeah. There is no, like, Aphrodite is Hazel, I'm sorry, flip that. Hazel is Aphrodite's creation. And, you know, some people have said, like, my mother, bless her heart, she's 88, and she she read it and she said, well, I really enjoyed the story, but I could have done without those gods. <laughs> I think, I think they were a little too naughty for her. Oh. <laughs> Although they're actually quite tame, but, um, you know, those philandering Greeks. Um, so Greek gods, I mean, <laughs> um, so <laughs> be clear here. Um, so I think that some people might assume that like, Hazel and James, that's the story, and then the Greek gods were layered on later as an afterthought, and that's just not true. They're, they, Aphrodite breathed them into being, and, and without her telling us about this couple, they, they wouldn't exist and we wouldn't love them. If you think about it, they're, they're very ordinary people. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing really all that, well, I mean, they're very special, but they're not singular. They're not you know, remarkable. I mean, James was like millions of other soldiers of his generation mm -hmm. and Hazel was like millions of other young women of her generation. And yet, and I, and I hope that's kind of part of what this story is about is the, the preciousness of, of one ordinary life and, and how each one is important to the gods or if you will, to God and to, to all of us as yeah. a human family. So, um, I hope that answers the question. Well, and I think it was significant that that their story wasn't significant, meaning they were very, very, their experience was very, very typical. Um, you know, it wasn't like Aphrodite was, you know, was telling the story about how he saved a thousand people and then she sacrificed herself for this and that. It was just a very typical story. And so when, when she's saying, I'm going to tell you this is the story um, that I'm going to tell you in my defense then it has to be special. And so you take out all the significant events and it's special again, just because the whole thing is about how to see through perceived brokenness to the wholeness that's inside. And that's what she wanted. And that's what we want. And that's what made it so significant. So I love how it all wraps in together. And I, yeah, I just think it's great. There was another one. Uh, how much time do you spend researching compared to writing the details in the story are phenomenal. Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, it's always hard for me to kind of figure out that equation because I research before I write, I research while I write, I research at every stage through the editing and revision, like right up even until <laughs> the copy edits. I'm still checking, checking, checking. Um, so I know that I spent all together about 15 months on this book, which was ridiculously short considering the scope of it and the amount of research that was necessary. It was super, super condensed. The, I wanted to bring the book out as close as possible to the centenary of the armistice. So I would have liked to bring this book out in fall of 2018, which would have been exactly 100 years from the end of the mm -hmm. war. But I didn't get the idea in time to pull that off. And so we kept it on spring 2019, which just meant round the clock, like no sleep, like, like really bad, really, really super intense process um, of producing this book. And I, you know, that I don't want to be replicating that again and again, because that was really exhausting. Um, but I just was so committed to bringing the book out this spring, and I'm glad I did. And my editor was equally committed, and I'm grateful that she was. And uh, we just pulled it off. Um, and she got married in the middle of it, which was, <laughs> ah, 
but we, we how managed. selfish. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I'm just kidding. It seemed it seemed fitting with all this Aphrodite business. But, Aww. Um, anyway, so it was super intense. Um, but I love the research, you know, and I, mm-hmm. I love learning about it. And uh, it was great because unlike you know my medieval project, there were all kinds of sources and audio records and videos and photographs and newspaper reports and things that I just did not have available to me when I was studying the 13th century. Yeah. So, so that was really fun. Well, and I love the last 13 pages of your book is historical note, but it should be historical notes um, because th- <laughs> there, there is so much truth that you took, so many factual people and events mm-hmm. that you weaved into the story beautifully. It never felt like it was telling. It never felt like a history lesson. It was just all real. Um, but I especially love what you wrote at the very, at the very end, just because to me, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. Hopefully it doesn't make you feel awkward. It's on page 463 and you're talking about researching and writing it. You said researching and writing lovely war made me love these soldiers, these Tommies and is it Poilus and Doughboys and Anzacs and Jerry's who fought and died along the Western front because they had no choice. But it wasn't until I traveled to France and Belgium, visiting preserved trenches and underground tunnels. So you actually went there as part of the, that's amazing. Still hollowed shell craters, mm-hmm. breathtaking monuments, war museums, and row after row of pristine gravestones, witnessing Europe's fidelity to their memory, that I began to glimpse the true cost of this war. I've never seen anything like it. Lovingly tended graves marked Welsh soldier, known only to God, broke my heart. A frequent theme in the writings of men at the front was their marveling at how, over their shell-blasted wasteland of the killing fields, a glorious sunset could still paint the sky, where the freshness of dew and birdsong could still make the morning sweet, even in the trenches. For all its horror and despair, for many the great war sharpened life, showing it for the brief and fleeting gift it was, and revealing home, freedom, safety, family, beauty, and love to be um, precious beyond price. Many never returned from the war. Others returned but were never the same. Still others returned to bigotry and hatred that history has yet to leave firmly in the past. They paid a price. Their children paid a similar price in the global war that followed. We owe a debt. And that that sentence is powerful because there this, there isn't a lot of books about World War One. a lot of novels. Um, and and I learned so much from that. And I fell in love with them and and my great great grandparents who served in world war one i have great grandparents that served in world war ii but you know you don't hear a lot about that um but the at the your last sentences we can choose to use whatever means lie in our power to be agents of healing hope justice plenty and peace and i think that describes you um because you know you said it's not you but what you do is you've taken the things that are in your power and you offer the healing and the hope and the justice, I've seen that firsthand, and, and the peace, and you are, you are a gift. And in this book, we, we didn't even talk about the, the racism element, which you wrote so beautifully um, and movingly, and it made me angry at the way he was treated. And it made me, um, I think sometimes when you, you know, I live in Buckley, and it's not diverse at all. We're like 90 cent, 90, 99% um, white. We're in a small logging community. And sometimes you forget that there's a whole world out there of people who are unkind. I mean, I know theoretically there are, but it just boggles my mind that there are people who, who do have those beliefs. And it breaks my heart for the people that have to live there, especially back then when mm-hmm. that was, it was, it, it was acceptable. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, we know about a lot of the problems and ills in society as abstract. You know, we wrote papers about them in school. Mm-hmm. But until we see things viscerally through the eyes and ears and skin of people that we know and care about, we won't understand it in a deeper way. And if our circumstances don't necessarily bring us in contact with enough people that we can get to know personally and care about personally mm-hmm. who face these realities, the next best thing is art, right? The next best thing is excellent drama, excellent cinema, excellent fiction, you know, all the arts, visual arts and, and everything, because they allow us to get to know characters mm-hmm. and care for them 
and experience their experiences, even if vicariously, and I, and I don't begin to suggest that that's a, an equivalency to really living with these horrors, but it's, it's the best we can do, you know, um, to broaden our exposure. And, and I hope that, that the, you know, reading list and bibliography in the back will make some people want to learn more and read some more of these firsthand accounts yeah. uh, that I read. And, so, yeah. I love how you named, you know, if, if you want to learn more about this, go read this book if you want to learn more about it. Because it wasn't like, I learned so much, guys. Wasn't this the best book ever? But you're like, here, go read this. Go read that. And, and that shows to me that you, um, it really was a lovely war to you. Um, the, the people that were the heart of the war and that fought in the war. And so I, I appreciate that. Um, we had a, a comment on here. Amy Martin said, I said, I read the book right when it came out because I wanted, because <laughs> I waited for like a weirdo for it to come out. But when I picked it up uh, to review for this evening, I, I could so clearly hear Aphrodite's voice again. It's powerful. Thank you. And yeah, you did a great job. Literally the voice. I don't know if you had any uh, say in the, the voice actors, um, but they were brilliant. And I have to say, you made me love Hades. <laughs> I was like at the end I was like oh okay he's like when if the fates don't do it then they're gonna have a word with me I'm like oh wait that she you know he channeled some Julie right there <laughs> well you know they they take their cues from me right <laughs> <laughs> well you are such a pleasure you are brilliant there's still other questions that um that we have but we ran out of time because I think we talked about all the just the really important stuff they were little questions like um um, how do different settings affect your story? Do you listen to music when you write? So just, you know, a couple other random questions. What we can do is um, if we have other questions that we'll, we'll put comments on here and I'll let you know there's more comments and you can answer those for the people that watch this afterwards. And um, we'll go from there. But thank you so much. You are, you have made my life better and you have made me a better person just with my association with you and with what you've written and you've been a blessing to me. And I know lots of other people so thank you thank you thank you for being here you are so kind it's my pleasure and you know when when you asked it was well, of course i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it for michelle we've bonded we've we fought in the trenches together or i watched <laughs> you fight off. and i was like like the next day i'm like yeah <laughs> the next day I'm, I'm giving him dirty looks from 20 feet away don't mess with julie <laughs> I'm tougher now. I, I, right. I'm good. Now. But yes, we did bond over that. And by the way, he was let go. Just so you know. Really? Yes. Oh, jeez. Well, I didn't report him to his boss or anything. Oh, I did. Like, I, did she really? Justice. <laughs> well, he was he was really rude. So there's that. He was, but he anyway. was nice the next day. Anyway, you are fantastic <laughs> and wonderful. And like, um. I said at the beginning of this, everyone go to julieberrybooks.com and see her other things. Her books are on there. There's wonderful links. I'm looking at it right now. There's links where you can buy her books. There's um, it talks about her and events she'll be at. You can contact her. She's got these cute blue glasses on. Um, <laughs> and she's just wonderful. But really, if you've read her book, any of her books, um, you're a good person for reading them. <laughs> I just listened to Brene Brown yesterday, so I'm all about shaming people. Oh, wait. Oh. <laughs> just kidding. But go and leave a review. Go on Amazon and leave a review. Um, because when people are searching for books, that's what they look at. And, and we want to help Julie get her light to as many people as possible because that's what she is. She's a light that, that carries hope and love um, all over the place. So, oh, thank, thank you, dear. You're so kind. You're Thanks wonderful. for this. And Thanks to everyone who joined in or will later. Yeah. And um, I promise I will send out a newsletter <laughs> this year. <laughs> I'm going to make myself do it before the summer's over. So, <laughs> Well, now there's a soft commitment on here. There you go. You're good. <laughs> All right. Well, you take care. Thanks. You okay. Too. Thanks. Good night. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.